Welcome to Books of Our Time, produced by the Massachusetts School of Law at Andover and shown nationwide. I'm Michael Coyne, your host for today's show, and joining me is best-selling author Jeremy Sharp. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Jeremy's latest book is called Triumph. It's a story of Jesse Owens in the 1936 Olympics. Like Cinderella Man, Jess, uh, Jeremy's earlier work, it is a very, very rich story. With the backdrop of the 1930 segregated America, the rise of Adolf Hitler in Nazi Germany, and America's own treatment of its returning athletes from those games, the story goes well beyond the usual sports story. Jeremy, what drew you to uh, write about Jesse Owens' triumph at the 1936 Olympics? Well, the things you said, really, I mean, it, it is a layered story. There's a lot there. Um, as magnificent as Jesse Owens' achievements athletically were at those games, when you consider the backdrop against which they were achieved, the political situation in Germany, an ascendant Third Reich, um, the fact that at the same time Jesse Owens was consigned to second-class citizen status here in the United States, I thought there were a lot of issues um, that were worth exploring and that haven't been explored in a long time. And certainly, I, 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 I think it's fair to say that this is the first book, 71 years after Owens won those four gold medals in Berlin, that focuses on his achievement at the Olympics and um, the political and social context. Do, do you look for that in your writing? Because in Cinderella Man, it also went well beyond just the fight in the arena and everything else. And, and as you said, the triumph actually is, is much more about history and its historical, the, the event in its historical context than, than simply just someone running a race. Well, it, the backdrop for Cinderella Man is, is really the Great Depression. That's the defining uh, story behind Jim Braddock's um, quest for the heavyweight title. Uh, this is only a year later, and we're still in the middle of the Great Depression, but that's, that's not uh, what is uppermost in the story for Jesse Owens, who's only 22 years old at the time, hasn't suffered through the Depression the way Braddock did. But yes, I'm, I'm looking for something that's more than just a sports story. Um, there are great sports stories, but it, it's hard to build, I think, you know, a compelling 300, 400 page narrative about specifically what Jesse Owens did just on the track, as amazing as it was, and the records that he set before the Olympics, the performance at the Games in Berlin. Uh, but what interested me were all of the other figures and all of the other currents running through the story. The early part of Jesse Owens' uh, collegiate career, um, you wrote about in the book in, in some depth the, the problems he was facing here from um, others in the track community with respect to bigotry and, and racism in, in the college community at that point. Was it that per pervasive that he really did feel that he was being singled out because of his race or that all black athletes at that time were? Oh, I, I, I think that's indisputable. Um, you know, this is a country um, during the 1930s in which <clears throat> Jesse Owens can't check into most hotels, even in the north, he can't eat at many restaurants, he can't ride in the front of the bus, um, he can't live on campus at Ohio State, you know, a school in what you would think is really the North. Um, there had been very, very few national prominent figures who happened to be African American at this point. There had never been a truly national sports hero who was African American. Jack Johnson had been the most prominent black sports figure, but he was anathema to white America when he was a champion from 1908 to 1915. Um, Joe Lewis was on the precipice of that kind of stardom, but just a few weeks before the games of the 11th Olympiad, he's humiliatingly defeated by Max Schmeling. Jesse Owens, uh, he, his story is, I think, um, inextricably about race. He's the grandson of slaves. He's the son of a sharecropper. He's part of the great northward migration from the South in the 1920s of so many rural Southern blacks. And uh, his life, obviously, at every moment at that time especially, was affected by the color of his skin. And there were those in the college community at that point that actually thought it was cheating to be using blacks in these uh, collegiate events. Oh, there's. There's no doubt about that. Um, you know, coaches who, who nurtured black athletes, coaches who recruited black athletes were certainly, um, there were certainly people in the athletic community 
who cast um, uh, a disparaging eye on that. And that's the only way to explain how we had so many all-white track teams, even at this point after blacks had won gold medals uh, at the previous Olympics, how um, you know Jesse Owens had offers from a number of schools, but not from every school, mm -hmm. although he was one of the fastest men in the world by the time he left high school. Uh, at Ohio State, Jesse had African-American teammates, uh, but that was the exception rather than the rule at most big American universities. How great of a college uh, athlete was Jesse Owens? He's the greatest college track star ever. Um, even today? Even today. Even today. What he achieved specifically, now he only competed at the varsity level for two years. Freshmen were ineligible back then. After his junior year, his eligibility was stripped from him. So as a sophomore and a junior, he competed. Half his junior year, he was ineligible academically. So he's really only com competing for about two semesters as a collegiate. But during that time, uh, he, he establishes a record of achievement that is unprecedented and unmatched since then, specifically at the Big Ten Championships 1935. On May 25, 1935 at Ann Arbor, Owens in the span of fewer than 60 minutes. It could have been 50 minutes, 45 minutes. Nobody is quite sure. Nobody had, had a watch on it. He sets five world records and equals another. Now, people who really know sports history, people who know this stuff better than I do, uh, will tell you that what he did on May 25th, 1935 uh, remains the most spectacular single day achievement in the history of sports. And he did that in college. So it's kind of hard to argue that anybody has ever lived up to that. And some of those world records held for quite a period of time after that. Oh, yeah, remarkably durable records, particularly the broad jump record, what we now call the long jump. Uh, Owens broke the world record that day by half a foot. He jumped 26 feet, eight and a quarter inches, and that record stood until 1959. Um, the dash records were um, uh, not quite as durable, but lasted for a while. Uh, and he would set other records that would last a very long time. Uh, you know, the thing that's most remarkable about how enduring those records were, I, I wanted to see for myself, you know, just how great was that? Because 26, eight and a quarter inches is still a very respectable long jump 71 years later. At the 2004 Olympics in Athens, it would have given him ninth place. <laughs> okay, I mean, we're talking about 71 years later with training, with you know, goals being set at different levels, with equipment, with rubberized tracks, with nutrition, with weight training, and he still would have been in the running. The um, track back in the 1930s was, as you described it, the sport of the masses. What happened? Why is it relegated to so much, so, so far down the list these days? Track really is, uh, for the most part, for most American sports fans, irrelevant now. At the Olympics, there's obviously some interest. Every four years, people get excited, perhaps, about a Carl Lewis or a Michael Johnson. But in much the same way that harness racing was one of the most popular sports, if not the mm -hmm. most popular sport in the country at the turn of the 20th century, track and field was that big up until really the 50s, I would say. Um, one example, 1950, when the Associated Press conducted a poll of 393 sports writers, it's it's a comprehensive half-century poll, greatest athlete, et cetera, et cetera. Six of the top 18 greatest athletes, according to this poll, were track stars. Now, if you did that from 1950 to 2000, you'd be surprised if you got more than one track guy on that list, and that would probably be Carl Lewis. I think what happened, it's not a great TV sport. Uh, you have to be there and kind mm -hmm. of soak it up for hours and see several events at once, which you can't really get a feel for that on TV. And beyond that, it really is linked, I think, in a lot of ways to our rural routes, mm -hmm. uh, like harness racing. When people had horses and would go from town to town in buggies, you know, when people, when there weren't basketball courts everywhere and there weren't football fields and sports weren't as hyper-organized as they are now, it was natural people ran and jumped and threw heavy things. <laughs> And so people had a greater interest in track and field. It was closer to them. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's just uh, just one of those cyclical things, and I don't think it'll ever be back to what it was, not here. 
What made Owen such a great athlete? Was it just natural gifts? Was it the hard work he put into it? Or what, what, what led to his achievement, in your opinion? Well, that's a complicated question, and I think uh, it, it deserves uh, a complicated answer. <laughs> um, he was remarkably gifted. Uh, there's no doubt about that. I'm sure if, if uh, he had never been touched by coaching, he would have been one of the fastest people in the world. As it happened, though, he had two very good coaches from a very young age who nurtured his talents, who honed his talents, who made him as good as he could be. Um, he had a coach named Charles Riley who discovered him when he was basically in elementary school, who coached him through junior high school and high school, uh, who, who taught him the fundamentals of running quickly. And he had a coach in college, Larry Snyder, who also got the most out of him. But Owens was, as I think I indicated earlier, one of the fastest men in the world when he got out of high school. And in fact, his first couple of years in college, he didn't improve that much because he was already so good. There wasn't that much room for improvement. And he wasn't, he, he was so fast, um, but he wasn't uh, a natural hurdler, for instance. Uh, he wasn't, um, you know, he, he set a world record in the hurdles because he was so fast, but he had no hurdling technique. Uh, he wasn't a good starter. He was slow out of the blocks, uh, the fastest runner ever. Uh, so it was more, it was more of a natural gift than I would say any, uh, any remarkable um, uh, ability to conquer the minutia of running. I, I would say, though, that while he was actually running in motion, he perfected his form. Now, despite being one of the greatest college athlete, athletes of all time and despite his uh, fame that would be coming from the Olympics, he did face a great deal of, of bigotry in college and then beyond that. How did he actually deal with that issue? He, he was someone who um, I think was in a lot of ways not oblivious to bigotry. That's certainly not the case, but he did not allow it to affect him uh, any more than it had to. Uh, obviously, like anybody else, he took slights personally, um, but he was able to overcome other people's bigotry and the slurs um, and the slings and arrows to a remarkable degree. He had um, a really even disposition and he was not, for instance, like Jackie Robinson who would come mm -hmm. 11 years later and break the color barrier in Major League Baseball. He, he was not a naturally confrontational person. He was not fiery. He was, uh, if anything, gentlemanly and dignified and had a very, very long fuse, whereas Jackie clearly had a short fuse. And by some, he faced a great deal of criticism because of his uh, demeanor in, in the face of that type of uh, bigotry, correct? That, that came later. You know, in the, in the 30s and 40s and 50s, I think he was considered in the mainstream of, of um, uh, resistance to white supremacy in the United States. He was you know, certainly through his deeds, a remarkably good example. Uh, he was someone who made millions of Americans, black and white, kind of rethink their ideas about race, uh, especially whites. But he was not a radical. He was not a militant. And in the 60s, when the civil rights movement became militant, he did not fit into that. Um, he, he did not change with the times. And there were certainly, uh, there were certainly black leaders at the time who felt that he could have been doing more, that he had been, in effect, an Uncle Tom. And that was a term that was thrown around, and I think it was unfair to do so. This is a guy from a different time mm -hmm. than they were from. Uh, but even then, he reconsidered his political philosophy and became eventually somewhat radicalized. In fact, published a book called I Have Changed in the early 70s. Um, the, his success in the 1936 Olympics almost didn't come about. Uh, because there was a real pressure to, to boycott those hit Olympics in Hitler's Germany. Who, where did the pressure come from and, and what were the reasons for it? Well, that's, that's one of the stories I think has really been obscured over time. Um, how close the United States came to not attending the games of the 11th Olympiad or the 4th Olympic Winter Games, which were also taking place in Germany um, the previous February, came very close to succeeding the boycott movement 
you have two sides of the argument. You have one argument, the pro-boycott forces are led by a Tammany Hall judge by the name of Jeremiah T. Mahoney, who could see that uh, bigotry anywhere was unacceptable. He did not want to send a United States Olympic team to Germany. He thought that that would only give the games credibility and, and hence give the Third Reich credibility. Um, and on the other side is the head of the American Olympic Committee, Avery Brundage, who, like any Olympic official, wants to see uh, the Olympics go off well, wants to see his team there rather than sitting at home, uh, and was also, I think, uh, pretty clearly an anti-Semite, a racist, um, a Germanophile, uh, all of those things. And, and so you really have a pitched battle between these two camps. And surprisingly, the pro-boycott camp was not just a Jewish camp. There were a lot of Catholics, uh, especially a lot of very prominent Catholics who were very much against uh, sending a team to Germany because of the Third Reich's anti-Christian policies and its persecution of, at that time, um, Roman Catholics and observant Protestants. So you get this, this battle between these two forces and it became, it was a very, very close debate and the pro-boycott forces just lost. Um, we need to take a brief break, so please join us when we come back. We'll discuss uh, Owen's success at the 1936 Olympics. Meeting a teen girl online is actually pretty easy. You can go into any chat room and just start talking. Most of the girls are usually so insecure and desperate for attention. Attention from older guys is totally flattering. They're so much more mature and understanding than the guys might. Age actually works to my advantage. They like to brag to their friends that they're dating an older guy, so I just play along and pretend I'm really interested. Interested in the same things I am. You can talk forever and really get to know someone without worrying about looks or whatever. That's the best thing about chatting. Chatting seems unthreatening to them, so they lower their guard. After a while, I start talking about how we're soulmates and how lucky we are to have found each other. Other people don't understand. I know what I'm doing. If you really care about each other, there's nothing wrong with me. Meeting them is the goal. Once I get them out of their house, well, that's when things get really interesting. Online predators know what they're doing. Do you? Welcome back. Uh, Jeremy, as 1936 uh, approached, 
Uh, Jesse Owens was clearly the favorite. He was the fastest man in the world at that point. Uh, he had to go into Germany and face enormous pressure under the most trying circumstances possible. Um, what type of athlete, uh, what type of man could, could face that type of pressure and nonetheless with all of the pressure on him uh, really achieve such great success? Well, I think he had to be a remarkably confident, and he was, but not overconfident. He worked hard. He took care of himself. Uh, he did everything he could to assure that there wouldn't be some last-minute injury that might sabotage his chances, as it had one of his great rivals, Euless Peacock. Um, he was, of course, just very good at what he did. Uh, he should have won all those events because he was the best in the world at them. He, it wasn't an upset. I mean, uh, this is a slight digression, but for instance, Al Order, who's one of the greatest track stars ever, won four consecutive gold medals in the discus. Each time that he won the gold medal, four consecutive Olympics, he was the underdog competing against the world record holder. That wasn't the case with Jesse Owens, but there were so many things that could have happened. A long boat ride, unfamiliar food, unfamiliar surroundings. Um, some kind of injury, although some people thought that injuries helped him focus. What, what was required of him was an ability to focus. Uh, he did that remarkably well. He was uh, not at all, he was unflappable, basically. With 100,000 people screaming at the stadium, uh, with Hitler glaring down at him, with his rivals lined up right next to him, uh, he performed remarkably well, not only in the finals, we know he won the four gold medals, but in the heats, he set record after record. In the qualifying rounds, he set record after record. He was, he did not have a bad moment at the Olympics with the exception of his second qualifying jump in the broad jump. Are there any comparable uh, performances by a, a different athlete under such incredible pressure that, that you're aware of? Well, you know, it, obviously, his situation is different. I would say the, there was so much pressure on Jesse Owens because so much was at stake for him personally. Uh, this was his one shot to be a star. He knew that. He had a family to support already. He knew as a black man coming back to the U.S. in 1936, there wouldn't, be, there wouldn't be the same opportunities for him that there would be for his white teammates. He knew he had to win the gold medals basically to assure his future. Uh, and then there's all the external pressure. There's the pressure of competing against Germany for the United States. Uh, there's the pressure of competing as a black man in a white-dominated society, trying to prove something there. Um, the, I think the only thing comparable, really, and we've mentioned him before, is Jackie Robinson and what he had mm -hmm. to do in 1947. And of course, that's over the course of seven months as opposed to 10 days in Berlin. Um, but in the sense that they, they both knew how much was at stake and what a great impact um, their deeds would have, I, I would compare Robinson and Owens. Uh, Carl Lewis won the same four events in 1984 in Los Angeles and did it spectacularly. And is, you know, if, if you consider the, the totality of his track career, probably the greatest track athlete ever. Uh, but he wasn't performing under these kinds of pressures, and he was at home. Well, and as I think you described it in the book, the rest of the world is worried about appeasing Hitler, and here he has to come in and, in part, de destroy the Aryan myth of superiority. Yeah, I, he, exactly. He, um, this is at a time, it's also important to bear in mind that this is 1936. It's not 1938. Uh, it's certainly not 1945. Uh, there are reasonable people smart people, not prescient people around the world who think that Hitler's Germany has gotten as bad as it will get. He's, uh, you know, he's, he's appeased his, he's placated his, his base by enacting the Nuremberg Laws, stripping Jews of their citizenship. He's, uh, he's been harsh against Jews and foreigners and gypsies and homosexuals. Uh, but, you know, now he's going to calm down, let the economy build. Everything will be okay in Germany. Um, but, but in fact, of course, things turned out quite differently. But in 1936, a lot of people were still interested, as you said, in appeasing Hitler and simply hoping for the best. Jesse Owens goes there, and while so many people are kowtowing to the Nazis, he is refuting their claims of supremacy with, with this remarkable performance. 
Was Hitler himself worried that the performance of America's black athletes would destroy his myth of Aryan superiority? Well, I, I'd say that he, he was certainly displeased that the African-American athletes in the U.S. team, not only Jesse Owens, but Cornelius Johnson and Ralph Metcalf and um, John Woodruff performed so well. But he knew going into the Olympics, as did everyone else, that the black American athletes were the best in the world. Um, so he had steeled himself for that. He was still upset about it. Initially, when he takes power, Germany's already been awarded the Olympic Games before the Nazis take power in 1933. He was against having the Olympics there for that very reason. He didn't want to see blacks and Jews competing against Aryans and perhaps defeating them. But he came to realize what a remarkable prop propaganda opportunity the Games would be and uh, lent his support fully. Uh, so he could see both sides of it. Ultimately, it was decided that having the games would do more good for the Reich than damage to it. And I thought you really played that story well with respect to the movie that the Nazis are filming during the Olympics, so it's sort of a story within a story that's, that's going on as the, as the Olympic games are changing, um, that, that they're worried about their propaganda machine at that point. Well. During the course of this, Lenny Riefenstahl, the brilliant German filmmaker and propagandist, is, is making a movie, a documentary about the games that will be called Olympia. It is even now considered perhaps the finest sports documentary ever. In 1934, she had made um, the incredibly powerful film about the Nazi party rally in Nuremberg called Triumph of the Will. And clearly, she's going into these games uh, looking at them as an opportunity to glorify again the Third Reich and to gl glorify Aryan manhood and womanhood. But when Jesse Owens uh, makes it impossible for him to be ignored and the achievements of the African American athletes in particular be ignored, she understands as a filmmaker you can't make a movie about these games with anyone else as its star other than Jesse Owens. And so that, that is part of the story and interested me because here you have the Third Reich commissioning a film about the games in which an African-American grandson of slaves is the star. You have the most famous propaganda filmmaker of all time making the film. But ultimately, if you watch Olympia, if there's one star who emerges, inevitably, it's Jesse Owens. Yes. Um, now, ultimately, America's black athletes were successful. The early success really wasn't Owens, but it was uh, Johnson and Al Britton, I think, initially. How did Hitler treat them when they were receiving their awards? Well, that's um, what happens is on the first day of the track and field competition, Germany has a great day. It wins its first two gold medals ever in track and field. Hitler congratulates the winners in his box. The whole stadium sees him putting his arm around them, shaking their hands, uh, bowing to them. Uh, he similarly congratulates the three Finns who finish one, two, three in the 10,000 meters as the Finns always did back then, and they look more Aryan than the Germans. You know, they're, they're totally, you know, these toe-headed Aryan types, the, the Finns. So um, as the day is going on, though, it becomes clear that an African-American is going to win the high jump. Uh, a few minutes before the competition ends, Hitler leaves the stadium. It starts raining. He's gone. Cornelius Johnson, African-American, wins the gold medal. David Albritton, Jesse Owens, his best friend, wins the silver medal. Uh, they're both black. Hitler's not there to congratulate them. There's a big uproar. How come, he, why didn't he congratulate them? The Germans, for their part, and remember, at this time, they're trying to please as many people as possible, not antagonize people, say Hitler was simply adhering to his schedule. He meant no offense. Um, he couldn't be there. He had to get, he had to, beat the traffic back to Berlin. <laughs> I saw that. Um, Do you, I mean, is that really credible? Is it, the Fuhrer has to beat traffic back to Berlin? That part of it's not so credible. Um, it is true that the competition went very long. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm the last person who wants to give the benefit of the doubt to, to Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. And there's no doubt in my mind or in um, the eyewitnesses that he was unhappy to see African Americans winning gold medals at these games. But the competition did go on quite long. It did start to rain. Let's put it this way. If a German was going to win the gold medal, he would have stuck around. Right. Maybe if it was a Finn or a Swede or a Norwegian or an Austrian, he would have stuck around. He left. And that caused an uproar. Now, when Owens ultimately won his uh, first medal, there is this legend that he was snubbed by Hitler. Uh, your book really sort of dispels that myth. 
Well, it's it, the, there are two things. Now, you know, he wins his first gold medal the day after um, Cornelius Johnson wins the gold medal in the high jump. But this story is already out there, the snubbing of the African-American athlete rather than the snubbing of Jesse Owens. By the time, what happens overnight in the midst of this uproar, the head of the International Olympic Committee tells Hitler, this is, uh, this is unacceptable. We don't want a political controversy here. You either congratulate everyone or you congratulate no one. Hitler says, fine, I won't congratulate anyone. Uh, and again, this is 1936. Hitler is, does not want to antagonize the head of the Olympic Committee on the first day of the Games. So by the time Owens wins his first gold medal... And, and can I just interrupt you? And when Owens won, the crowd, which was most, mostly German, really was enthusiastic in, 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 its, in its support him. for him. Every time he stepped on the track, the crowd went wild for Jesse Owens. Uh, and that was a surprise to him. He had been led to believe that he would be received in hostile fashion. And in fact, it was exactly the opposite. And this unnerved Hitler, I think, somewhat as well. This isn't what he had been hoping for. I'm not saying that he wanted to see Owens jeered or even thought about it to that extent. But people who were sitting next to him as Owens won medal after medal said that they could see in his face um, displeasure. And so you've got two elements of the story. Was he really snubbed Jesse Owens? You could say, no, he wasn't snubbed at all. Hitler had promised not to congratulate anyone. But at the same time, Hitler found ways to acknowledge the achievements of other athletes. He could have met him under the stadium, out of view. He could have said something that he did not do. He did not acknowledge, he did not recognize, he did not congratulate Jesse Owens. But technically, I don't think you could say he snubbed him because he was told not to congratulate him publicly. Well, by um, eyewitness accounts at the time, including Owens himself, he didn't, he related that he didn't feel snubbed by Hitler. That's another element of the story. The, st the story all over the United States in particular is how could uh, the Chancellor of Germany show such disrespect for our black athletes. Banner headlines everywhere. Hitler snubs Jesse Owens. Jesse Owens keeps telling ev anyone who'll listen, I wasn't snubbed. He couldn't congratulate me. In fact, I think he waved at me I, right. and I waved back at him. He said this several times. Uh, Nobody wanted to hear that story. Well, I shouldn't say nobody, because some of the black papers in the U.S. reported that Hitler treated Owens quite well, based on Owens' own comments. And in fact, one of the African-American reporters who was covering the games in Berlin said there was a headline in the Pittsburgh Courier, uh, the African-American paper in Pittsburgh, you know, Hitler lauds Jesse Owens, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a difference of opinion at the time. <clears throat> And Owens maintained for a, a long time uh, that he was not snubbed and, in fact, said when he got home to the U.S. after the Olympics, when he was campaigning for the Republican presidential candidate that fall, Alf Landon, that it wasn't Hitler who snubbed him, but Franklin Roosevelt. Right. Um, the, why did he later, uh, in his later years, suggest, or not suggest, state that Hitler did snub him? Is it because of pe that's what people wanted to hear? That's what people wanted to hear. Um, times have changed, uh, times had changed, uh, you know, it was one thing telling people Hitler didn't snub me before the United States was involved in the Second World War, before the horrors of the concentration camps. It was a different thing to say that afterwards, clearly. Uh, Owens, I think, felt justified in um, changing his story over the years, emphasizing different parts of it because the world had changed. People wanted to hear the snub story. Um, he would tell people, no, Adolf Hitler didn't shake my hand, but I didn't go there to have, my, to have him shake my hand. Uh, it was a much better story to tell. Now, he's won four gold uh, medals at these <clears throat> Olympics. Um, he's as famous as anyone in America, loved by both black and white. How was Jesse Owens then immediately treated by his own Olympic Committee and the AAU. Well, that's, that's to me one of the most remarkable parts of the story that I think very, very few people remember at all uh, or know at all. After he wins his fourth gold medal in the 100-meter relay, the 4 by 100 meter relay, um, he's immediately whisked away on this, um, on this uh, barnstorming tour of Europe with his track and field teammates. 
they're being sent to city after city while the Olympics are still going on and other events to raise money for the Amateur Athletic Union and the American Olympic Committee. And they're being flown to Czechoslovakia, they're being flown to Germany, flown to England, and they're taking part in all these meets. They're exhausted. They've been at the Olympics for 10 days. They're not even allowed to stick around at the Olympics to soak in the atmosphere. And they're not getting a dime. They're not even getting sandwiches to go on the road with. And finally, Jesse refuses to go on the last leg of the trip to Stockholm, where there's going to be another exhibition. He says, you know what? I'm exhausted. I can't take this anymore. I want to get home. I haven't seen my family in a month. There are all these offers that I have to capitalize on now, or they're going to evaporate. And he says, no, I'm not going to Stockholm. And when word reaches the head of the American Olympic Committee, who also at this time is the head of the Amateur Athletic Union, Avery Brundage, he suspends Jesse Owens indefinitely from amateur sports on the day that the games of the 11th Olympiad end. No athlete has ever dominated an Olympics to the extent that Owens dominated those games. And before they're over, he's kicked out of amateur sports. And they called uh, Avery Brundage slavery Avery. Did the athletes really feel mistreated by uh, the head of the Olympic Committee? They did. They did, and he would only reinforce that reputation as the years went on when he became the head of the International Olympic Committee after the Second World War and stayed in that post until after uh, the Olympic Games in Munich in 1972. Brundage was uh, stubborn, uh, pig-headed. Um, he was a bigot. Uh, he did a lot of great things for the amateur athletic movement and a lot of great things for the Olympics. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but he was also somebody who couldn't see the forest for the trees. And uh, he did get nick nicknamed Slavery Avery, uh, justifiably so, I think, and is perhaps best remembered not for what happened in 36, but in 72, insisting that the games must go on the day after the massacre of Israeli athletes. And the suspension in 68 of the, the, the militant black uh, athletes who uh, had won gold and simply wanted to express themselves. Right. I mean, he was the head of the International Olympic Committee. By that point, he wasn't, um, uh, he, it wasn't something that he did personally, but certainly something that he approved and condoned. We have to take a brief break. Uh, we'll be back in just a minute. Jesse Owens, American Negro, the world's fastest sprinter, sets a terrific pace from the start and passes the Italian Mariani easily to hand over to Metcalf. He flashes ahead, faster, faster, past Humber, Canada, to send Draper away, the second chain. And Draper, look how he's moving, he's clear, he's taken off the rest of the field in the curve, and the last chain, Frankie Wyckoff, shoots off, they can't possibly catch him, he's hurling himself down the straight to victory for America, and a new world record at 39.8 seconds, second Italy per Germany. kids here we are at the slavery exhibit now as you can see the slaves were kidnapped from their homes chained together for weeks they would cram them onto these ships in very appalling conditions thousands of women and children are being smuggled across the border sexual trafficking of children and as you can see right here they were treated like animals they worked all day long for no pay. In sweatshops raided by police, children forced into slave labor. Some of the slave masters were very cruel. They whipped them and they beat them, as you can see in some of these pictures. Sure, well, brutal, even fatal. So, before moving on, are there any questions? Um, does this still happen today?
When I found out my jeans were made using child labor and sweatshops, I wrote a letter to the company saying, reconsider your labor practices. A few months later, I get a letter back saying, thanks for being a loyal customer, and they included a coupon for a 25% discount on their jeans. So I got smart, wrote letters every day to all the stores that carry the brand, asking them to stop supporting the companies who use child labor and sweatshops. And I just kept getting letters back, thanking me for my concerns, and more coupons for more discounts on more jeans. So I'm telling my friend about it, and she flips out, saying that between all the letters and coupons, some paper company cut down a small forest driving off two indigenous tribes, hundreds of endangered animals, killing thousands of plant species, some of which may have contained vaccines for HIV, cancer, and syphilis. Meanwhile, the guys cutting down the trees are 13-year-old kids who will work night and day for months just to save up enough money to buy a pair of jeans made by child labor in sweatshops. Every day, online predators make their way into homes uninvited and unnoticed. Help delete online predators. To learn what you can do to protect your kids' online life, visit CyberTipline.com. Ultimately, Jesse Owens returns to the United States a, a hero. Was he able to find financial success or even inner peace uh, in, the, in the, the decades that followed? Well, he comes back after the Olympics and he celebrated their ticker tape parades. Everybody's writing about him. Uh, uh, he's held up as this remarkable example of what you know, African Americans can achieve if, even in this society, but nobody wants to give him a job. Uh, and he really does struggle, I'd say the first 15, 20 years after the Olympics, he's still a young man, to find his way professionally, personally. Um, it's, it's a tough go. Uh, everything that he thinks is gonna happen, you know, easy money thrown at his feet, going to Hollywood, performing on Broadway, none of that materializes. Um, and so he has to find other ways to make a living, to make a name for himself. But all of that changes in the 1950s. He becomes, people become nostalgic about what he achieved. That's part of it. You know, you kind of need that 20 year uh, gap to let people um, appreciate, let it soak in. And also, uh, his whole life is changed by the Cold War. Mm -hmm. uh, the U.S. is engaged, obviously, in this ideological struggle with the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union is going around the world. Uh, you know, can, can, trying to convince the peoples of the world that its system is superior to the United States. Look at the U.S., look at how they treat their own minorities. Uh, they call that democracy. Uh, so the U.S. responds, in part, by trotting out Jesse Owens, um, sending him around the world as a goodwill ambassador, making speeches about how great the American system is, about how there are opportunities even for its minorities. Uh, he goes around the world making speeches to that effect. Uh, he becomes a convenient goodwill ambassador for American industry, for American government. And uh, I think that he really is allowed to spend the remaining years of his life being Jesse Owens. And, and I think making important statements um, and telling people his story and affecting a lot of lives. And he was apparently a mesmerizing public speaker. Um, and, and well-loved, and he raised a family, and I think basically happy, but it's tough for him to get that appreciation initially after the games, the way that, you know, today an athlete would be set for life. Mm -hmm. What did his success mean then to black Americans, and what does it mean today to black Americans? I think his success at the time was something that was really inspiring to black America. Um, it was very important, uh, not just in a vacuum, but because only a few weeks before, 
As I said, Max Schmeling knocks out Joe Lewis. 1935-36, people love Jesse Owens. He's a big star, but he's here and Joe Lewis is here. Joe Lewis is this undefeated heavyweight challenger, a phenomenon. People can respond emotionally to boxing in a way that they can't, even in track and field when it was, when it was popular. And he is uh, neutered by Max Schmeling, who's supposed to be washed up. And then Schmeling becomes this token of Aryan supremacy. He's a German, obviously. And so Owens now goes to Berlin. He's got to avenge Joe Lewis's defeat. Uh, and he does that for black America. He does it in spectacular fashion. Uh, he is simply by virtue of what he achieves on the, on the field in Berlin, a hero to black America. And he becomes a mainstream hero as well uh, to white America. A and in its way, it's very important. I mean, it's obviously hard to, to you know, put a finger on, you know, what doors did this open? Uh, what did it lead to? What is its place in the civil rights movement? Uh, it's easier to do that 11 years later with Jackie Robinson. Uh, but, but I think Owens had, had a significant effect. And today, um, I think that impact is still felt. He is a pioneer. He is... He represents the beginning of the ascendancy of the African-American athlete. Um, and, and that's tremendously important. Somebody had to be first, and it was clearly him. Now, what is it between it's fathers and sons now? What is it between fathers and sons that you have a connection, obviously. Your father is legendary sports writer Dick Schaap. Um, in fact, you won an Emmy that's named after him. So those are pretty big footsteps to follow in. What is the connection that you think you have between why you both followed and became so successful in, in, in a difficult field? Well, I, I mean, um, you know, obviously I was fortunate uh, because my father was, uh, you know, such a prominent figure in the business. There was a lot of entree, um, you know, and I grew up in the business. Uh, uh, I think also, I mean, I got to see him do what he did for so long. And, uh, uh, you know, it would, would have been hard not to, you know, tr learn some of that through osmosis. Um, and, and I tried to absorb as many lessons as I could. And we worked together, too. You know, <clears throat> I was very lucky uh, in the final years of his life to work together. We hosted radio shows together. We uh, produced projects together. I worked on some of his books as an assistant for him. And so, you know, I got to see what he did. And it looked like so much fun. Uh, and so rewarding. And, uh, you know, I could never imagine having grown up in an environment like that, going to a job that I didn't completely love. Um, and, and, you know, kind of, my father was, um, you know, he, he, was, he was so smart and he was so learned in so many ways that it kind of forced me to absorb as much sports history as I could so I could just maintain a conversation with him about it. And, uh, and I really uh, plunged into it. And, uh, uh, and I, I, I can't remember a time when you know, I wasn't reading about sports history and trying to absorb it. One of the first books I remember reading was A History of the Olympics that he wrote and read it again and again. So you know, in a lot of ways, I was very, very fortunate. Do you think uh, because of who you follow, there's a greater obligation to, to excel and, and do your best work all the time? Um, I think, I, I think most of the people I work with feel that obligation regardless of what their father did, but um, there's certainly more pressure, I guess, in some ways to live up to it. You know, there are always going to be comparisons and there are always going to be um, unflattering comparisons, perhaps, but, uh, you know, you know that going into it. I mean, if, there, if there's a 5% negative to following in somebody's footsteps who was great at what they did and you're trying to live up to that, it's 95% positive. Okay, now we're in a law school and there's a lot of 20 and 30 year old guys around here who would swap jobs with you in a heartbeat. What, what is it like to have really the dream job of most young males ar around here? It's a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of fun. I really, I really love what I do. Uh, you know, um, I, I, I feel bad for people who don't love what they do. Um, you know, I, I, I know a lot of lawyers. I went to school with a lot of people who went to law school. A lot of them love the law and they're really into it, and a lot of them don't. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, there are, you know, people who, um, uh, who do it because it's um, financially rewarding, it's prestigious, it's challenging, but it's, it's not 
I don't, I, I don't think that there are too many people in any business who take more pleasure from what they do than I do because uh, I get to do the kinds of stories I like to do at ESPN. I get to work on things that I consider um, important or, and, and fairly substantial uh, for the most part. And, um, and also in my spare time, uh, write a book here or there. So uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Is that your advice to others to to love what they do, whatever that is? Well, I don't I don't know how you how you can do it if you don't. I mean, you know, people, obviously people have obligations and people have to make decisions. I I was lucky, you know, I I, I had entree in a business that I wanted to go into, uh, and so I, I wouldn't judge anybody. But I know that I would hate to have a job where I'm staring at the clock all day waiting for it to hit five o'clock or six o'clock. You know people I work with, the people in my industry, were always staring at the clock wishing we had another two hours to get whatever we need done. Can, can we talk about the craft of writing a little bit? We try to produce... I'm hardly an expert, but <laughs> <laughs> you should talk to my editor. <laughs> uh, we try to produce g good writers around here, so I'm hoping that you might be able to tell us a little bit about how your books went from the idea in your head to uh, really first-rate pieces of writing. You know, it's, it's... I really think more than anything else, I mean... You know, like, like running, like music, like anything else, I think that there are natural talents that people have or they don't have, but um, it's also about discipline and rewriting. Uh, you know, my father was, a, was a, a demon for rewriting. He said, you know, not, not only rewriting, you write something, you know, take a look at it again. It's going to get better. Take a look at it a third time. It's going to get better and better. And the more you write, the better you get. I mean, there are people, as I said, who are who are more naturally gifted than others, but nobody is just a natural. Uh, everybody gets better through, through repetition, um, through doing it as much as you can. And for me, uh, I, you know, they're all different approaches. My father was highly organized when he sat down to write a book. He mapped out every chapter, he mapped out. I, I kind of let it flow more. Um, I see where the research takes me from page to page. Uh, People have all different kinds of approaches. You know, like John McPhee, I think, you know, charts every sentence he writes, a brilliant writer. Um, but, you know, I, I think, you know, no matter what level of talent you have, you're never going to be the best that you can be without doing it over and over and over, over and writing as much as possible and, and striving for clarity. Is that what you think makes uh, really good writing is the clarity of expression and thought? Yeah. You know, you, you have to you have to look at your sentences. You have to say, you know, is this easy to read? And you know, it's not dumbing it down. It's just, you know, I, I, I like, you know, and also I think a lot of it has to do with my background, TV writing. Um, you know, I think about flow mm -hmm. a lot and and um, transitions and making them work and, and trying to make things as seamless as possible without any you know uh, stop signs or any slow down. You know, you. There, there's, there's something to the written word that's also, that can also be enhanced by an appreciation of the spoken word in terms of uh, rhythm. Was this an easy book to write? I mean, you know, the, the, the process itself? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. I think, um, you know, it's a serious book in a lot of ways because there are so many things going on with, with grave consequences. Um, I enjoyed it. I love the research. Uh, I love kind of intertwining the three stories of, of the games in Germany, the boycott movement, and Jesse's personal story. Um, but uh, in, in some ways, Cinderella Man w was more fun because these are more lively characters. They're, they're characters. They're, they're having more fun. Uh, this, is, this is, as I said, more serious. I enjoy writing. I enjoy sitting down and getting it done. I'll admit sometimes it's hard to find the discipline to get to the computer to do it. But once, once I'm there, usually I, I enjoy it. How was Owens treated during the 1960s with the, the much more militant civil rights movement that occurred at that time by other Olympic athletes? He was, uh, he was considered a relic at that time. He was considered somebody who didn't get it. Uh, his approach, the slow approach to civil rights, uh, was not what was being embraced by Harry Edwards, uh, by the athletes who uh, composed that great Olympic track and field team in 1968 in Mexico City. And in fact, after Tommy Smith and John Carlos make the Black Power salute, Jesse Owens goes down to talk to the team to tell them, you know, 
this is wrong, this isn't the way you should be getting your statement out there, and he's all but kicked out of the room by the black athletes. Um, but he, he changes. He, he comes to a, uh, a realization that change has been too slow. And, uh, and he makes a very uh, big turnaround and, and decides that he should agitate for speedier change and for greater reform and for more equality for black Americans. But, uh, and I think that was something he always had, uh, that, that was something he always wanted, but his approach was different. He came from a different age. And his own political philosophy, as you said, he wrote a book himself to try and explain himself in the 1970s. He did. He wrote a book called I Have Changed, which was a response, essentially, to the black militants who said that he wasn't uh, moving rapidly enough for change. Um, he ultimately dies of, of uh, lung cancer from smoking cigarettes. It seems like yeah. an odd end to one of the, the greatest athletes of... Yeah, he, he didn't smoke at all as a young man, and he picked up the habit in his, in his late 20s, I believe. Uh, and died of lung cancer at the age of 66 in 1980. Just uh, a chain smoker. And sad for somebody who, you know, worked um, in physical education for so long, you know, was a spokesman, a goodwill ambassador, you know, to get kids to exercise. He could not control that habit. Where would you rank him on the list of greatest athletes of all time? You know, it depends how you define that. Uh, I, if you define greatest athlete as somebody who could do anything and do it well, then I think you have to go with Jim Thorpe. He was a brilliant Olympic track and field athlete. He was a baseball player. He was one of the greatest football players ever. It's tough to beat Jim Thorpe. But if you're talking about somebody who excelled at one thing in particular, or a couple of disciplines anyway in track and field, and, and that's the most elemental athletic endeavor, track and field, and you take into consideration um, the consequences of what he achieved, you could make a very good argument that Jesse Owens is the greatest athlete ever, the most important athlete ever, and the most gifted natural athlete ever. And the story itself, where would you rank that in the list of all-time greats? Um, I think it's the greatest sports story ever. I think what he did in Berlin, and you know, it sounds like uh, you know, just the synopsis of a young adult kind of book, you know, grandson of slaves, goes to Berlin, refutes theory of Aryan supremacy. That seems trite. But at, uh, you know, at its core, what he did and what his victories represented, both here in the United States and globally, striking out against Nazism, striking out against American bigotry, and doing it in such uh, remarkable fashion, I I'll take Jesse over just about anybody. What do you see his legacy to be? His legacy are those victories, um, the victories at 100 meters and 200 meters in the broad jump in four by 100 meters and over Nazism and over Jim Crow, um, despite all the impediments in his path in Germany during the Olympic fortnight in the previous 22 years of his life here in the United States as a second class citizen, overcoming those and, and doing it as I said, with this, this grace, this dignity, this self-awareness, and a commitment to improve the lives of other people, which I think was entirely genuine, uh, that, that is ultimately the legacy of Jesse Owens. And he really was one of the most dignified and graceful athletes ever. Oh, he was. He was beautiful to watch. Um, he had this remarkable style uh, where it seemed that he was barely touching the track. Uh, he had no vanity in his style. He, he, not, he never looked at the other runners. He never strained. Uh, he ran in an entirely kind of upright uh, position. Uh, he, he was beautiful to watch. He was physically beautiful. He was this, you know, he had these remarkable legs, and, and uh, that's the one word that people use more often than anything else to describe both his running style and his physique. Beautiful. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks for joining us. Michael, thank you. Thank you. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Hope we, we hope we gave you something to think about. Until next time, be well. Thank you.